This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning. Good morning. Yes, welcome, church family. Thank you for worshiping with us this morning. You know, I had it on my heart today that if you have never heard God's voice or you're not sure if you've ever heard God's voice, to begin praying and asking God to speak to you, to leave a few quiet moments in your day just to listen, God wants to interact with you. He wants you to know his voice. Amen? Amen. Would you turn around and shake the hand of the person next to you and say, God loves you and so do I. Hannah and I are so happy that you've joined us in worship today. As we're approaching the holiday season, we'd love to provide you uplifting resources that will both encourage you in your relationships with your loved ones and more importantly, in your relationship with God. I love what the holiday season represents, and it's such a special time as we gather with family and friends, whether to celebrate old traditions or to start new ones of your own. But this season can also be a time where many of you feel lonely and are needing God to come through in an amazing way in your life. I just want to encourage you today that God's very name, Emmanuel, literally means God is with us know that he sees you exactly where you are and he is with you this season. Now our prayer is that you'll experience God's amazing and transforming love in ways you never have before. All of us here at the Hour of Power love you and we're here for you. So you can call anytime the toll-free number on your screen or log into our website today to request the special offers we've prepared for you. They really will make a difference in your life. Thanks again for joining us, and I also want to just give a special thank you to our friends and partners for your incredible ongoing support. And remember always, God loves you, and so do we. Well, we're so glad you're here today, and we're just uh, so honored to have you in the house, and so glad you guys are here. We just believe that you're going to leave with joy in your heart, and, uh, and we just know that this is going to be an awesome week for you. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for calling us here. We love you, God, and we pray in Jesus' name that every person who comes here brokenhearted, hurting in any way, Lord, that you would uh, send people out with joy, strength, and fresh vision. We thank you that you can do this. Holy Spirit, just pour out into the space, and to everybody watching on television, we thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
seated. In preparation for Bobby's message, the words of our Lord found in 2 Timothy 4. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you, keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Discharge all the duties of your ministry. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Church, may we begin our lives with the end in mind that we might finish well. Amen. I was lost in the darkness My hope was all gone I was searching for strength In the dark of the night, I had to give up the fight. No fight left in me. I wondered if there could be a second chance for me.
Wow, Deborah Rosenkrantz, thank you for being here. Deborah's a German star, a vocalist, and um, a wonderful presence, and you have an inspiring story of faith, love, and hope. And would you just welcome with me Deborah Rosenkrantz? Oh, Hi, thank you. Thank so you glad so to have much. you here. So, you're a big deal everywhere, but you're particularly a big deal in Germany, and uh, it's such an honor to have you here, especially for our German audience. Our German director, Frank, is here. Yes. Frank, would you raise your hand? <laughs> welcome. And we had our international uh, group last week. But uh, I just want people to know a little bit about your story because I think it adds a lot of power yes. to what yes. you're singing. Um, first, you've been singing like most of your life, haven't you? That's true, yeah. I started when I was nine years old. All of my family is musical. And we used to sing everywhere, in churches, in prisons, wherever we got invited. We always wanted to share a message of hope. It's awesome. So you grew up in a Christian family. And for you, singing was like a ministry then. It was, totally. And I always loved it. But then something happened in my life that changed everything, and I think that gave power to the whole message today. Mm -hmm. But at first, it was a super hard time. I got sick from eating disorders, mm -hmm. just because of one sentence that was spoken over my life. Because I grew up in an amazing family. Yeah. I felt safe and yeah. loved. Yeah, yeah. But uh, I was in love with that guy, and you know, when you're 13, 14. Well, tell me the story. <laughs> what, what happened? So there's a guy you were in love with, and... Um, yeah, I was playing handball professionally, and one day, he was watching us. And uh, so I tried to do my best, but afterwards he came up to me and he spoke to me for the first time, so I was super nervous. And he said, Deborah, you're such an amazing handball player. I just wonder how you're able to run being this fat. Wow. And these changed, words have changed my life forever. Yeah, what I, happened? That was the moment I realized your parents love you, they're your parents, but all the others see you as the big girl the ugly girl, you're not worth anything, and you need to lose weight in order to be loved. Mm -hmm. So I tried to do exactly that. I lost over 60 pounds in the shortest amount of time, and uh, I couldn't walk anymore. I lost my hair, didn't have my period anymore, which was hard because I always wanted a family, and the doctor told me it won't work anymore. And mm -hmm. one night when I was at my lowest, I, I felt that I was gonna die and the doctor had told me it would happen in the next weeks. I went to a concert and my parents didn't want me to go, so I tried to sneak by their sleeping room at two in the night when I got home. And then I heard my mom cry in the middle of the night. And I went closer to the door to hear what was going on and she said, we can already get a coffin for our daughter because our da daughter's gonna die anyways. But that's when my dad responded in a very loud and strong voice. I'll never forget that. He said, no, we have to pray for our daughter. Our daughter is going to live. Mm. And then they started praying. And it I've heard many prayers in my life, but it was a prayer coming out of hope mm -hmm. and hopelessness. Mm -hmm. Faith in that big, mighty God we always talk about, but doubts at the same time. It was the most honest thing that showed me there is hope for me. There is a savior, and I just need to open up the door and get that help. And that's what I did, and I opened the door, half dead, really. And I said, Mommy, Daddy, I need your prayers. I need Jesus back in my life. I want to get healed. Mm -hmm. And that's the night that changed my life. It was the turning point. Today, I'm totally healed. I can have as many children as I want. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow, great. Wow, it's such an inspiring story. And of course, that's what the song you just sang. I mean, you wrote that one thing, one prayer, right? One prayer, yeah, that's my whole story in one song. And this is the song I'm using now wherever I go, in schools or in churches. And that's right, you have a ministry now oh, yeah. to <laughs> girls and women who struggle with this. And you tell your story and you're able to sympathize with what they're going through and encourage them. And I think that's just so awesome. Exactly. What do you say to the, there's so many people who are watching all over the world. What do you say to them? And maybe you could say something to our Swiss, German, and Austrian oh. viewers in German. I don't know. I won't try in Swiss. That would be okay. funny. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that accent. Oh. I could do it, though. Um, you want me to talk in German? Sure, yeah. Okay. Maybe say it to the camera right there. Hey, liebe Freunde aus Deutschland und aus Europa, ich will euch einfach sagen, ihr seid unendlich geliebt, ihr seid so wertvoll in Gottes Augen und sucht bei ihm die Antwort auf eure Fragen und er wird euch zeigen, dass es nur einen von euch gibt und dass ihr wertvoll seid. 
That's great. My German is really good, and I understood everything you just said. Ah. But maybe you could just uh, ex just translate it for our he audience. Does speak German, I found out. <laughs> No, I just want to tell you, you are so loved, loved beyond measure. And sometimes this is just a line, a phrase, but it is the whole truth. And if you're looking for answers in your life, go to a savior, go on your knees and pray that one prayer that will change your life. Deborah Rosencrantz, thank you for being here. Thank you're you for treasure. having me. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. Thank you. Hi friends, we are in a message series on our thoughts and the ways in which we not only limit ourselves but our neighbors by saying negative things like, I'm not smart enough, or that can't happen, or I'm too young or too old. I'm so passionate about helping you focus on your thoughts and connecting with God that I've asked our team to put together these two-sided inspirational thought cards. 
Because everything begins and ends with our thoughts. In our busy, noisy, day-to-day -day lives, we often don't pay attention to what we're paying attention to. We don't think about what we're thinking about. These cards have positive, uplifting phrases to help you throughout your day. Yeah, that's right. Phrases like, courage begins with a single step in the direction of the thing you're afraid of, or a grateful heart is a magnet for miracles. And an extraordinary life requires extraordinary courage. During this message series, we will see how the ways in which we've limited ourselves through thinking has gotten us to where we are and how we can change our thinking to inherit our destiny. Let's change our thoughts and change the world. I encourage you to start each day with Jesus and focus on things that will change your mind for Him. Please call, write, or go online today and request the special six pack of two-sided inspirational thought cards with quotes from Bobby. We hope these cards remind you how much we love and appreciate having you as part of our community. As we move into fall and begin preparations for the upcoming holiday season, here at the Hour of Power in Shepherd's Grove, we want to also help prepare your hearts and your minds for the season of Advent. You know, Advent is a time of waiting and a time of hope. It's a time of believing that in the milieu of life, all the challenges and suffering that we face, somehow God is going to break through. This Christmas season, we want to help you detach from all your to-do lists and rest in the peace of Jesus Christ. So we've put together this pocket-sized Advent reading plan designed to help you as you prepare for Christmas. Like preparing for a party, Advent is a time of preparing our heart and soul for Christmas. And the best way to do that is to spend time in God's Word. Yeah, this booklet includes scriptures, short devotions, prayers, and reflections to guide you through the 25 days that lead up to Christmas. You know, all of us go through things in life and Advent is that season where we go, okay, no matter what's going on around me during the season, I'm going to fill my heart with hope, not despair, and believe in my future in Jesus Christ. Spend a few minutes each day with this booklet and tune out all the busyness of the holiday season. Our prayer is that this reading plan will help you in your walk with God during this special season of waiting. Please call, write, or go online today and request this Advent reading plan. We hope it reminds you how much we love and appreciate having you as a part of our ministry. Thank you and remember always, God loves you and so do we.
Thank you, choir. Love you guys so much and appreciate all that you do. I just want to talk about my, this robe. I've been wearing this robe now for a year, and uh, it's been such a, a great uh, season for me. Um, for me, it's, it, it was a, it's been a way to honor my grandfather. It doesn't fit all together right. It's a little short, and the, I don't have a doctorate, but I'm wearing doctor stripes, and um, I've been really just feeling in my heart that maybe it's time to take a break from the robe. And uh, so I think what I'm going to do is we're, we're working on putting together a memorial for um, the Crystal Cathedral and especially for my grandparents. Uh, we've been in talks with the Crystal Cathedral about doing something on the fourth floor. And I'd like to um, lend this robe and put it in a glass case and let it be there for people who are really uh, in, into what my grandfather did. And... Uh, it was really, really hard for me. You know, it, we wear these robes because it's a traditional service. We like tradition. We, we like a lot of these things. But it, to be honest with you, a big heart of it was, in a way, saying goodbye to my grandpa and, and sort of feeling like he was sort of with me, which I, in a way, know he is, and with us as our founding pastor. So I just feel like it's been a beautiful season, but I think it's time to, to not have the robe every week. I'll probably have it on high holidays, maybe Christmas and Easter and things like that. I think it'll be a nice compromise, but... When I show up in a suit next week, I didn't want you to be, be surprised. I hope that's okay, everyone. <laughs> Friends, would you hold your hands out like this as a sign of receiving? Let's say this together. I'm not what I do. I'm not what I have. I'm not what people say about me. I am the beloved of God. It's who I am. No one can take it from me. I don't have to worry. I don't have to hurry. I can trust my friend Jesus and share his love with the world. Thanks. You can be seated. Today we're continuing our series called As a Man Thinketh. It's based on the proverb that says, As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Or as a woman thinketh in her heart, so is she. And we believe the word of God. We believe that what the scriptures say about thinking about the mind is true. Very simply, you become your thought life. What you think about and what you dwell on always, always results in circumstance. Your thoughts will become your future. Think about what you're thinking about and you can see where you will be five years from now. Your thoughts become your friends. What you think about and how you think about your life, you will attract people that think the way you do. You want to be around people that are positive and joyful and loving and kind and compassionate and gracious? Then you have to think those kinds of thoughts too. It is law. It is how life is. So stop warring against your circumstance while harboring the thoughts that got you there. And begin to change your thoughts and you will change your world. Amen? There's a great story. One of, the, one of the best thoughts we can change is thinking not so much about right now and being always so worried about the short term, but fostering the kind of thoughts that have a mission for our life, a vision for who we want to become, and even though we're not there yet, holding that vision before our mind. I read a great story from a guy named Dr. Robert Persig, and I know it sounds funny, but the book was about repairing motorcycles. I don't even own a motorcycle. Don't ask. It's a long story. But <laughs> in the story, he talks about ascending a Himalayan mountain with a bunch of monks. And these guys are old, and at the time, he's young, and he's so excited to get to the top of this mountain. And they agree to go with him. He's become friends with these monks, and they start walking up the mountain. And he's kind of at the front. He's like, guys, let's go. And these old monks are just kind of like, you know, kind of hobbling along, and they're making jokes about things, and they're stopping, and they're getting water, and they're picking flowers and putting it in their satchels and things like this. He's like, guys, we've got to get to the top. And there he is, full of energy, and there they are, sort of just <laughs> slothy. And... <laughs> and he says, after, they get, after several hours, they're getting up the mountain, and now he's exhausted, and they are just like they were when they started. <laughs> Still moving along. Still smiling, still enjoying the walk. And the thing he said that I thought was so important was he learned in that time that the monks had reconciled the present and the future. That there was something that the future gave them a target, gave them a goal, it gave them a vision, 
But it wasn't all about that. In a weird way, having a goal, but being at peace with the fact that they weren't there yet, liberated them. It gave them the freedom to put those flowers in their satchel, to take a sip of water, to tell jokes, and to smile at one another, knowing full well that they were making progress, getting where they were called to go. Today, I want to talk about this idea, this very scriptural idea, that we ought to keep our sight uh, as long-term thoughts and long-term vision, that we ought to think about our life in terms of legacy and in terms of heaven. But we ought to not always be in a hurry to get to our destiny. And I think to strike the balance between the two, holding a mission for my life, a dream for my life, a destiny, but being at peace with the pace that God gets me there is the right way to think. I think so many people today are on one or the other. It's only about the goal. It's only about getting there. And they don't realize how they're hurting their kids. And they don't realize that they're, they're burning themselves out or hurting their body or not taking care of themselves. And then you have other people who have no really big long vision for their life. It's only like right now. And, and very often they miss out on the long term. And you're probably one or two of those. Pendulum goes one way or the other. But the perfect way to think, I think, is to think long-term so that it liberates you to be present right where you are. Think long-term and allow the long-term vision for your life to liberate you and give you freedom in what you're called to do. Another way I put this is think like a farmer. It seems like Jesus loves the analogies of the farmer, you know, the one who thinks in terms of cycles. The, the farmer has no crops in winter, you know, everything's barren, but that's when he plants and He's not worried about the fact that he doesn't have his crops yet. And he knows that there's nothing he can do to hurry those crops along, to make them grow faster. And, and even if he does, it might ruin his crops or, or make them contaminated in some way. And so he follows the easy rhythms of farming. You plant in winter, you tend in spring and summer, and you harvest in fall. And because he knows that, he doesn't worry. But he also has his eyes set on harvest, doesn't he? And that's why he gets up early in the morning, way before he's ever going to reach his goal, to plant that seed, anticipating victory in his farm. In the same way, think like a farmer. Think ahead in your life and do the hard work now to be where you want to be when the harvest season comes. Amen? Be kind of kind of person that is willing to work hard now, even though there may not be any fruit in it. They say that studies have shown that above every type of character trait, that success in every aspect of living, whether it's success relationally, in your business, or any other aspect of life, the word that most links to it is this one word, willpower. Willpower. The ability to do what you really, really want to do. It's more important than education. It's more important than starting out with a good family. It's more important than any of these things that we know matter. The number one thing that is going to dictate whether or not we get where we want to go is willpower. The ability to carry on even when it gets hard. To have the resilience that when we fall down, to get back up. To every time we face failure, instead of facing the shame by blaming other people, we blame ourselves or we don't blame anybody. We just decide, I'm going to keep going. I'm going to get to my harvest season. I'm going to plant now. And if there's a fire, if there's a flood... I'm going to keep planting. I'm going to keep tending. I'm going to keep living in the rhythms of what I'm supposed to be. And so I believe a, a long-term mission and vision for your life, thinking in the long-term, allows you to have the willpower to endure the little things that could derail you and the big things. Look, I know a lot of you are going through a lot, but I want to convince you that God has called you to live for something much bigger than whatever tragedy you're going through. You will not be known for your tragedy. You will be known for your victory. And your victory will come because you foster the right kind of thinking, because you foster a vision, a vision of who you want to be and where you want to get to, not blaming other people, not falling into self-pity or despair, but choosing that just like those Fat, happy monks, you're going to take one step at a time towards that mountain. You're going to ascend. Now, whatever pace God wants you to go at, and you're going to be present now and at peace with where you are, even though you haven't gotten there yet. You keep your eyes on the mountain, 
and you keep going. Amen. You're going to cross that finish line, and you're going to do it with victory. I believe in you. Second Timothy is such a great letter, and it's a letter from Paul to his, his protege, Timothy, a young pastor. Paul's now an older man. God, I love Paul. You know, so many modern theologians don't like Paul because he's so offensive, and he's so, like, rough around the edges, and he kind of says it like it is. It's very, if you studied old, old school Judaism, Paul was a, was a Jewish rabbi, a Pharisee, who was persecuting Christians and was, was almost faultless in his obedience of Torah and brilliant. I mean, it's a, it's a great teacher, intellectual. Um, you get this sense that even as a young man, he had many people following him because of his, his genius. And here he is an old man, and, and, and he looks back on his life and how wrong he was and how he became this new person who, even though he was still very Jewish, was now also very Christian and was following this, the rabbi Jesus and was living for him and, and teaching new things like joy and love and, and, and victory and, and, uh, and, of course, here, right thinking. And so Paul is writing to, this is like at the end of his letter, he knows he's about to be executed and martyred. He's in a prison under one of the craziest emperors who's ever lived, Emperor Nero. And he knows he's probably going to die. And so these are the last bit. This is his like sort of closing paragraphs in his last letter to Timothy, knowing it's going to be over. And he's writing to Timothy, and he's passing on his mantle to this young pastor. He's passing on his legacy. And he says, in the presence of God, he's talking to Timothy, and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing in his kingdom, I give you this charge, preach the word. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when people will no longer put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. That is such human nature, isn't it? Time will come. It's always been that way. We as human beings naturally fall into bubbles. Right now, you're, when you read that sentence, you were probably thinking of all the other people that hear the things their itching ears want to hear. And don't realize the political bubbles that we're in, the religious bubbles that we're in, the national bubbles that we're in, the culture bubbles that we're in, and the ways we only want to hear the things our itching ears want to hear. He who desires knowledge above comfort will become wise. Those who have ears to hear, let them hear. That the things you don't want to hear are the best things you should hear. The things you don't want to hear are the best things you can hear sometimes. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you, keep your head in all situations. There it is, the thinking, right? Guard your thoughts. Think the right kinds of thoughts. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Discharge all the duties of your ministry. And then here comes the sort of beautiful, famous part that Paul says. And he's, you can almost hear the sadness in his voice, can't you? He says, for I'm already being poured out like a drink offering. Already being poured out. What does that mean? He's probably been tortured. And the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. Do you want to be like Paul, by the way? Do you want to be able to say these words when you cross the finish line? I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. He's going to give that crown to you too. Paul always had his eyes set on the prize, and the prize for him was a life that honored God. That in everything he did, he preached the word, he kept faith alive, and he never gave up, and he crossed that finish line. And here he is, probably bleeding, broken, in prison, about to die under a crazy person, and he simply says to Timothy, don't give up, my son. Don't give up, my son. You finish well. Don't be like everyone else. You cross that finish line. You cross that finish line. God has given you a vision for your life. Keep your eyes on that vision and on that mission. You want to be that way? I know you do. 
I know you do. You want to live a life that honors the Lord and live a life that makes a difference in the lives of others. And I'm so proud of you. So Paul kept his eyes on heaven and on the th throne of God. And it reminds me of this quote from Jim Elliott, a modern martyr who before he died says, he is no fool that gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Amen. I want to be that kind of person. So what do you live for? What are your, truly your values? What really do you care about? You may find that you think your, that your values are not really what you think. I think it was Stephen Covey who said that we should always begin with the end in mind. Forgive me for getting dark here, but doing funerals as a pastor has made me want to live for more. I've done lots and lots of funerals, and all of them are important, and all of them matter. They're just as important as a birth, probably two most important stages in a person's life, birth and death. And when I do these funerals, you can tell. In every funeral, everybody says something good, but you can tell when people really think it's good and when other people are just sort of there. I don't know about you, but I really, I don't want the preacher to lie at my funeral. How about you? you know, I don't want the preacher to get up there. He was so great. He was so, people loved him. He's the best. Don't make preachers lie. I remember my first funeral. I was, I was just a kid, you know. I was like 22, 23, something like that. I just started seminary, and, and there was a funeral for this woman, and, and it was, it was crazy because when I got to the, the parents said to me, I actually got, I accidentally fell on this funeral. They asked me to do an opening prayer. They didn't tell me to do the funeral. And then when I got there, she was like, hey, what's the plans for the funeral? I'm like, I don't, I don't know. I've never done a funeral before. <laughs> so I'm like, I need 15 minutes to put something together. So I went back to my office and I, I was like Googling how to do a funeral. Like I, <laughs> I literally did that. I'm like. So I get there, and there's not very many people there, and which was a surprise, because the woman who died was a, a young woman, maybe in her early 40s, and she seemed pretty. And I, I was doing the funeral, and her parents before, they said, I want you to, we want you to just say that no matter what, her parents loved her. And, they, and I thought, well, that's an odd thing to say. Of course, your, of course her parents loved her, right? And they got there, and there weren't many people there, 15, 20 or so. And I preached a sermon and shared a few things and then read the Psalms. And then at one point I, I said, as you do sometimes in funerals, is there anybody here who wants to say something about the deceased, something kind or share a memory? About a minute went by, and nobody stood or did anything. And the mother stood, and she looked back at everybody, and she said, I don't care what she did. I don't care. We still love her. We love her. She sat down with tears in her eyes. And I still have no idea what that was about. In a way, I feel like it's none of my business. But I felt awful for those parents. And I felt, felt really bad for the people who were there. And I thought, wow, like so many of the decisions that we make in life, we don't think about how we're going to finish. I don't see that to make fun of, but I remember if, if Covey is right and we ought, to, we ought to begin with the end in mind, no matter how old you are or how young you are, you ought to imagine what people want to say at your funeral. You imagine, in a perfect world, what do I want them to say? What do I want them to say? Do I want them to snicker when the pastor says he was such a nice guy? <laughs> Do I want the pastor to snicker when he says she was so compassionate and generous and gracious? You imagine your funeral. You imagine what people are going to say about you there. And those are your values. You may think you have other values, but what you want people to say when you pass, those are your values, and those are what you ought to live for. And I believe that you'd get there and you'd want... I know what I want people to say. I want my kids to say he was the best dad ever. I want my grandkids to say he was the best grandpa ever. And my wife to say he was the greatest husband ever. We loved each other so much. And my friends to say he was a truer friend than any I ever knew. That's what matters. And if I build a thousand churches on a thousand hills with tens of thousands of people, but my children don't love me, what have I done? And so we as people ought to live our life, not only for that funeral, 
but for the resurrection. When we're raised from the dead and we look at the throne of God and we look into the eyes of Jesus, are, we, are you going to be filled with joy? Are we, is he going to just say, well done, good and faithful servant? And that's what we ought to live for. You live for that kind of life, you're going to have the most joy-filled, godly, awesome life you could ever have today. You live for today. I just believe it. Well, you know that. And that's why you live for what really matters. Look, I want you to succeed in business, and I want to do well in ministry. If you're in ministry, go for it in ministry. But never forget that your true values, your true values are what you want the Lord to say about you and what you want your friends and family to say about you. That they were a life-giving, friendly, Christ-like person in my life. This is D.L. Moody who said this, but he's our greatest fear should not be failure but succeeding at something that doesn't matter. That's the biggest danger in America, isn't it? Most of us are driven. Most of us have goals. But we forget that sometimes those goals that we have, they're not really our values. And when we actually achieve those goals, we achieved something that really wasn't that valuable to us in the first place. Wow. Remember, you have a legacy. Everyone has a legacy, and long after you're gone, your life is going to make ripples in this world in ways you could never imagine for generations. One thing that I realized when I became a parent was that people who really love you take on your character flaws. (laughs) They do. People who love you think your character flaws aren't so bad because they love you. I'll never forget when uh, my son, Cohen, he, was, he loved to get into the fridge and raid the cheese. He's like a little guy, you know, he was like three at the time. And, you know, and he, so he'd open the fridge and go for the cheese. And one day, he's, I got so sick of telling him not to do it. I'm on the couch, and I turn back and I go, Cohen, no, like this. And he goes. <laughs> and then, it, like, you see his hand start to reach for the cheese very slowly. And I go, no. And then he goes, closes the fridge walks away very slowly. (laughs) And then it was like two days later, and he's sitting, and he asks Hannah, he says, I want some potato chips, please. And Hannah goes, no potato chips right now. And he goes, no! (laughs) No! (laughs) And then Hannah, of course, she looks at me, and she's like, That's the thing we don't realize, is that our legacy isn't just our memory, our legacy is our character. That we pass on not only the good things about ourselves, but the bad things as well. And that's why it's not important to be perfect, but it's important to be honest about your imperfections. And honest that you're a work in progress. I can tell you, um, doing what is right is always better in the long run. It's especially true with our speech. How many times have you regretted saying something in anger when you were just not feeling good? You wish you just wouldn't have said something. Or lying. Never lie. It'll always come around. And by the way, it's too much to remember. (laughs) When you keep your eyes on the mountain, you're able to be at peace with the fact that you're not at your destiny yet, even though it seems like everybody else is doing it. I promise you, so don't hurry. You don't need to hurry. You're not the one getting you there anyway. The Lord's doing it. So trust in him, and he'll get you there. I always think, whenever I read the temptation of Jesus, I always think the temptation is one to hurry. Here, Jesus is hungry, and he's like, he knows he's going to eat soon, you know, maybe in the next few days, but the devil's like, turn those stones into bread. Just do it now. And he knows that someday people are going to know he's the son of God, but he says, hey, jump from this steeple, and the angels will catch you, and they'll know now. You know, you'll get it right now. And he knows someday that that. The father's going to put him on the throne of the earth. But the devil, who currently sits on that throne, says to him, hey, just bow down and kneel to me and I'll give you everything. I'll give it all back to you right today. You don't have to do anything. In all these cases, the enemy is in a hurry. The enemy is in a hurry, hurry, by the way, because he knows his future isn't very bright. But you don't have to be in a hurry because time is on your side. Heaven is your home, and you're going to go nowhere but up as long as you go in the easy rhythms of grace. So, 
whether we're as a church or as individuals, we ought to have a mission for the kind of life that we want to lead. No matter how young you are, think about your legacy. I, I think if you're 16 and you're a teenager and you're watching today or you're here in the church, think about what kind of legacy you want to have even as an old man. And from the very beginning, you'll start planting the right kinds of seeds that will make a big difference in your life. And that's why I love this, and I'll close with this, this quote from the Greek proverb. It says, A society grows great when old men plant trees whose shade they know they will never sit in. Right? How many of us are sitting in the shade of trees and we look and we say, thanks mom, thanks dad, thanks grandma, thanks grandpa, thanks mentor, thanks teacher. I want to be a person like that. How about you? Those are your true values. So don't hurry. Don't bend the rules. And in your thinking, always think about that. Your legacy your vision for your life, and your mission for your life. And you will stay on the straight and narrow path that leads to life. Amen. Hi, friends. We are in a message series on our thoughts and the ways in which we not only limit ourselves, but our neighbors by saying negative things like, I'm not smart enough, or that can't happen, or I'm too young or too old. I'm so passionate about helping you focus on your thoughts and connecting with God that I've asked our team to put together these two-sided inspirational thought cards. Yes, everything begins and ends with our thoughts. In our busy, noisy, day-to-day -day lives, we often don't pay attention to what we're paying attention to. We don't think about what we're thinking about. These cards have positive, uplifting phrases to help you throughout your day. Yeah, that's right. Phrases like, courage begins with a single step in the direction of the thing you're afraid of, or a grateful heart is a magnet for miracles, and an extraordinary life requires extraordinary courage. During this message series, we will see how the ways in which we've limited ourselves through thinking has gotten us to where we are, and how we can change our thinking to inherit our destiny. Let's change our thoughts and change the world. I encourage you to start each day with Jesus and focus on things that will change your mind for Him. Please call, write, or go online today and request the special six-pack of two-sided inspirational thought cards with quotes from Bobby. We hope these cards remind you how much we love and appreciate having you as part of our community. As we move into fall and begin preparations for the upcoming holiday season, here at the Hour of Power in Shepherd's Grove, we want to also help prepare your hearts and your minds for the season of Advent. You know, Advent is a time of waiting and a time of hope. It's a time of believing that in the milieu of life, all the challenges and suffering that we face, somehow God is going to break through. This Christmas season, we want to help you detach from all your to-do lists and rest in the peace of Jesus Christ. So we put together this pocket-sized Advent reading plan designed to help you as you prepare for Christmas. Like preparing for a party, Advent is a time of preparing our heart and soul for Christmas. And the best way to do that is to spend time in God's Word. Yeah, this booklet includes scriptures, short devotions, prayers, and reflections to guide you through the 25 days that lead up to Christmas. You know, all of us go through things in life and Advent is that season where we go, okay, no matter what's going on around me during the season, I'm going to fill my heart with hope, not despair, and believe in my future in Jesus Christ. Spend a few minutes each day with this booklet and tune out all the busyness of the holiday season. Our prayer is that this reading plan will help you in your walk with God during this special season of waiting. Please call, write, or go online today and request this Advent reading plan. We hope it reminds you how much we love and appreciate having you as a part of our ministry. Thank you and remember always, God loves you and so do we.